Okay, so cell membrane part two here. A membrane structure results in selectively permeability, selective permeability. So this means allows things to go through the cell membrane, and selective means it allows only certain things to go through, so it's selectively permeable. Uh, before we go on, though, it was brought to my attention that I wrote back on this second to the last page here, um, glycolipids twice. So let me fix this. Membrane carbohydrates may be covalently bonded to lipids, forming glycolipids, or more commonly to proteins. So it should be glycoproteins. I accidentally wrote lipids twice. So let's correct that. It's glycoproteins. Glyco meaning carbohydrates attached to another molecule like a protein would be glycoproteins. So let's look at the selectively perme uh, permeable membrane. A cell must exchange materials with its surroundings. And so this is a process that's controlled by the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane um, controls what can go in and out of the cell. They are selectively permeable. regulating the cell's molecular traffic. So let's look at the major components of the cell membrane and talk about this permeability. So the permeability of the lipid bilayer. So that's, remember, the main part of the cell membrane is that phospholipid bilayer. With the, and remember, the inside with the tails are hydrophobic and the outside are hydrophilic. So hydrophobic or nonpolar molecules such as hydrocarbons. We know that from before that hydrocarbons, the bond between carbon and hydrogen is a nonpolar bond, can dissolve in the lipid bilayer and pass through the membrane easily. And that's because the main thickness of the phospholipid bilayer is hydrophobic. Now, other molecules, large polar molecules such as sugar do not cross the membrane easy. So like sugar like glucose as an example. That's an example. Um, would not cross the membrane easily, uh, meaning that it can't cross the lipid bilayer easily. So therefore, things that can't get through the lipid bilayer very easily um, have to get, they still can get through. Like glucose is a major a molecule that our cells use for energy. So the glucose does get into cells. How does it do that? It gets through the other major component of the lipid bilayer, which are those proteins embedded in the membrane. So transport proteins allow passage of hydrophilic substances across the membrane. Some transport proteins, called channel proteins, have a hydrophilic channel that certain molecules or ions use as a tunnel. So let's draw that. So here's your lipid bilayer, and then you have this molecule here that has a channel through it. This is the rest of the molecule. All right, so, and then here's the rest of your lipid bilayer like this. So this is your lipid bilayer. So large polar molecules can't get through the lipid bilayer because of that hydrophobic interior. So right here, this is your hydrophilic tunnel, meaning that the amino acids that are... Um, make up the protein in the interior are hydrophilic. So therefore, they either have polar R groups, um, more electrically charged R groups, so they're hydrophilic. And so then you're creating a little mini environment in here that's hydrophilic that allows something that's hydrophilic to pass through that membrane so it doesn't have to go through the lipid bilayer. Um, channel proteins call their special ones that facilitate the passage of water. These are called aquaporins. Facilitate the passage of water. So these guys allow um, water to 
go into the cell. So water is a small polar molecule, but it still doesn't go through the lipid bilayer. They used to think it went through the lipid bilayer, but it doesn't. Um, it, they found these small pores, um, channel proteins called aquaporins. Other transport proteins called carrier proteins bind to molecules and change shape to shuttle them across the membrane. And so going back over here to this picture here, this right here would be a carrier protein. This would be a channel protein that we're just talking about. So carrier proteins change shape. So I'm going to try and attempt to draw that here. Let's go back to the carrier protein. So, so you have your lipid bilayer, and you have molecules on one side of the membrane. Let's say that we're going to go to the other side of the membrane. So what happens is... I'm going to draw this. All right, and so, again, not a great artist, but you're going to get the picture here. These guys can bind here, bond and bond. All right, once these guys bond, what happens is we want to get this, these guys to the other side of the membrane. So over time, imagine that this protein changes shape. And so now this side is going to be closed. And then let's say now we have the shape change here where we have triangles instead of those semicircles. And so these guys then will come out and go to the other side of the membrane. So let's say this is inside and outside the cell, inside, outside the cell. So therefore, we've just gotten these things outside of the cell, and that's by the changing of the shape of this carrier protein. So that's a, an example of that. So a transport protein, whether or not it's a carrier or a channel, carrier or a channel, um, is specific for the substance it moves. So therefore, um, not just anything can go through here, this carrier protein, the specific molecule. Same thing with the tunnels. The tunnels are specific for specific molecules. And so therefore, if you want to get multiple types of molecules, then you need multiple types of proteins embedded in the membrane. All right, so that is the membrane structure and its permeability. Next, let's look at um, types of transport in terms of what we call it, um, whether or not it requires energy or not. So passive transport is diffusion of a substance across the membrane with no energy investment. It doesn't require any input of energy. So diffusion... is a tendency for molecules to spread out evenly into the available space. So although each molecule moves randomly, diffusion of a population of molecules may exhibit a net movement in one direction. So um, net means that you may have some moving back, but you have more moving forward. So at dynamic equilibrium... as many molecules cross one way as cross in the other direction. So let's go through some examples with that. So this first picture here, we have these molecules of dye separated on one side, um, you have water, the gray is the water, and these molecules of dye are dissolved in the water. So you have water molecules and you have dye molecules. On the other side of this membrane, notice this membrane here, uh, 
has just plain water, so there's no molecules of dye. And notice that the membrane has, I'm going to put here just to show you, that they, they have pores, all right? So therefore, there's, certain, there's openings of a certain size. And basically, in this case here, this membrane, as long as the molecules are small enough to move through these pores, they can move to, from one side to another. So all, all molecules have kinetic energy. So the molecules, the water molecules are bouncing around, the molecules of dye are bouncing around, and so on. And so what this is showing you is the molecules of dye moving. Um, and so these arrows are showing you it bouncing around. So some of the molecules bouncing, one so may hit the membrane and bounce back and ricochet off. So that's what these pictures are showing you. But some of them randomly move and hit this pore, and when I hit to the pore, they get to go to the other side. And so therefore, we start to see some of these molecules um, of dye on the other side. And so um, if this was water, we'd start to see the water become a lightly colored here. And so then what happens is these molecules continually move. They all have kinetic energy, the ones on this side as well as this side. So they're moving, and so some more molecules on the left hit the pores and move over. But notice that some of the molecules can also move from right to left because they're still bouncing around randomly and it's possible that they hit the pore and move back to the side. And so therefore, that's what it's talking about, exhibit a net movement in one direction. So in this case here, we have more diffusion going in this direction. I'm gonna do a big arrow here, all right? More diffusion going this direction. And then we have less diffusion. Let's do a smaller arrow going in this direction. So you have less, oops, less diffusion. But notice though, because there's there's more molecules over here, the frequency that they hit, the chances of them hitting the pores are greater. So therefore we have a net diffusion in this direction, your net, meaning that you take away all the molecules moving this way minus the molecules moving this way, you still have more molecules overall moving to the right. And so therefore, we say the net diffusion is to the right. And so they continue to move until they are an equal concentration. That's what equilibrium um, is. And so when, if they're an equal concentration, then statistically, they should bounce and hit the pores at the same rate. And so therefore, statistically, if they're in equal concentration, they'll go back and forth at equal rates and the, the concentration will stay the same. And that is a state of equilibrium. And so that's how diffusion works. And so this is um, the diffusion of one solute from one side to the other and what happens. And you don't have to add any energy to this. So if we had this in the lab, um, this would happen re re regardless. We don't have to make the molecules move. They have um, natural kinetic energy that they that will cause the movement. No input of energy. So we say that substances diffuse down their concentration gradient. Concentration gradient is the difference in concentration of a substance from one area to another. So we started out here with an area of high concentration, high, these little um, brackets mean concentration. So you have a high concentration of dye and to lo and low concentration of dye molecules on this side. Um, actually, no concentration because there was no dye. So they go from high to low, down their concentration gradient, kind of like a hill. Um, and so, <clears throat> so by the time they reach equilibrium, is there a concentration gradient here? No, there's not a concentration, so therefore there's going to be net mo no net diffusion in one direction or another because they're going to be diffusing equally. So therefore, no work must be done to move substances down the concentration gradient. We don't have to have that input of energy for them to do that. Um, the diffusion of a substance across a biological membrane is considered passive transport. because it requires no energy from the cell to make it happen.
So let's look at this other example here. So this is looking at two dyes, so the um, on opposite sides of it, selectively permeable membrane. So they have these pores, and notice that both dyes, the lighter color is on the left and the darker color is on the right. They're separated by this selectively permeable membrane. So the arrows down here correspond with um, the colors. So the lighter arrow corresponds with this molecule, the darker arrow corresponds to this molecule. So you can see that this one has a higher concentration of the lighter molecule on the left, so its net diffusion is going to be to the right, and this one has a higher concentration on the right, so its net diffusion will be towards the left. And so we see that this process is happening here. So these molecules are moving. Some of the dark ones hit the pores and go to the left side. Some of them um, don't. They could ricochet off. Um, same thing going on with the lighter molecules on the left. Some of them hit the pores and go to the right. So now you're starting to see some light molecules here. Some of them don't. Um, they don't ever hit the, the pore. And so therefore, over time, this is going to continue happening where the net diffusion um, is left to right for the lighter and right to left for the darker until eventually equilibrium is reached for both of them. And so when equilibrium is reached for both of them, they will go back and forth at equal rates, um, and so there is no net diffusion in one direction or the other. So that's just another example. So we just talked about the movement of dye in water. We didn't, we didn't never even talked about what's going on with water. So let's look at the effects of osmosis on water balance. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane. So movement of water from one side of the membrane to the other. The direction of osmosis is determined only by a difference in total solute concentration. So how do you think of water concentration is by how much solute there is. So, so for instance, um, we could have a solution, and if it has no solutes in it, whoops, off the thing here, let's say it's 100% water, that means it's 0% solutes. So, so if there's no solutes on there, that tells you something about the water concentration because the water concentration then is all water. If there's nothing, no other molecules, if 100% of the molecules in the solution are water, then um, uh, that's the highest concentration of water you can get. But if you have a solution with some dye molecules in it, then what happens to that percentage of water or the concentration of water if you have some... Um, dye in it. That means that there's higher than a 0% solutes because the dye is the solutes, what's being dissolved in there. So let's say it's 10% solutes. What percent water then? If it's just one solute, like a dye molecule dissolved in water, it's going to be 90% water. So, so therefore, we can figure out the concentration of, of water and where the higher concentration of water is is based upon the solute concentration. Um, water diffuses across the membrane from a region of lower solute concentration to a region of higher solute concentration. Let's talk. Let's look at that. The region of lower solute concentration. Lower solute concentration is the same as what? Higher water concentration. So the lower the solute, 0% is the lowest, the higher the water. So therefore, it, uh, we can think of it as it diffuses from lower solute to regions of higher solute, or we can think of it as regions of higher water concentration to lower water concentration, high to low. So if these two solutions were separated by a semi or selectively permeable membrane and provided that water can get through there, where is water going to diffuse? Water is going to diffuse this way. Where would the solutes diffuse? They would diffuse this way until equilibrium was reached. So let's look at an example. So this this is called a U-tube. It's a piece of glassware, all right, shaped like a U, very different than the website. Uh, and it's separated by, down here, a selectively permeable membrane. 
So let's read this here. It says, sugar molecules cannot pass through the pores of this membrane, but water molecules can. So what you have is a sugar and water uh, uh, sugar and water solution. So on one side and a sugar and water solution on the other side. The little dots here are the sugar molecules. So you have sugar molecules on either side, and they're trying to show you that you have the same volume of water, all right? And they're telling you that this side has a higher concentration of sugar. So more sugar molecules per volume that are per like milliliter or something um, than this side. So this one is a lower sugar um, or solute concentration. Sugar can't pass through. So sugar, all of these sugar molecules on this side are going to stay on the left. All these guys are going to stay on the right. What can move is water. So then what you have to do is say to yourself, where's my higher water concentration? On the left or the right? Can you, can you tell me that? Pause it if you need to. I want you to think through this. So this has a lower sol solute concentration. That means that of all the molecules here, more of them are water. So therefore, the left side is going to have a higher concentration of water than the, the right side. So therefore, the net diffusion of water, that's what this, is, this arrow here is showing you, is that water will move from left to right. So water will start diffusing through um, in order to reach equilibrium. So then it will continue to diffuse. Notice here the volume goes up on the left side, or sorry, the right side. That's because water's moving. And so um, that's what we see here that... Um, down here is we're looking at this right here, this box right here blown up. So we're looking at the molecular level, what's going on here. And so you have this right here, you have solutes, all right, and this is a solute right here. This is a solute. All right, so this is your sugars and this is a little bit of the sugar molecule. Look at what happens here. Um, on the right-hand side, you have the higher concentration of sugar. And if you remember from the water chapter, that water will form a hydration shell. They're, they hydrogen bond to the charged areas of the sugar molecules. So all these little water molecules right here are sticking to these sugar molecules. And so what happens is then there are less water molecules on this side to be bouncing around that are free and not involved in dissolving the sugar. And so therefore, less water molecules will... Um, hit the pores, and therefore less water molecules will go from right to left. On the left side, there's just fewer solutes, so the water molecules, most of them aren't involved in dissolving the sugar, so they're not attracted to, or they're not um, hydrogen bonded to the sugar, so they're free to move about, and so therefore, because more of them are free, they have a greater likelihood of hitting those pores and moving from left to right. So therefore, if we look at the diffusion, more water molecules are going to be moving to the right-hand side than to the left-hand side because there's less solutes and therefore um, they're, they're free to move. And so therefore our overall movement of water is from left to right and that's why we see this go up and it'll go up until equilibrium is reached until you have the same um, concentration of water molecules on the right side that are free to move around that you do on the left side, and then they will go back and forth equally. And so that is what we call osmosis, the movement of water through a selectively permeable membrane. So let's turn the page here. So let's look at how this plays out with cells. So this is entitled Water Balance of Cells Without Walls. So without walls, this is like animal cells. We don't have cell walls. So Tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a, a cell to gain or lose water. So, um, uh, so depending upon a solution, water will go into the cell or out of the cell, depending upon where the higher concentration of water is, inside or outside the cell. So there are three different solutions that we're going to talk about. Let's look at the first one, and that is isotonic. An isotonic solution. So solute concentration is the same as that inside the cell. There's no 
net water movement across the plasma membrane. So if we go here, um, let's say this is a beaker of water, and let's say that it's 100% water on the outside, and, um, or let's say it's not 100% water, let's say it's 50% water on the outside, and this is your cell. So this is your cell right here, and this is 50% water. That means it's 50% something else. So 50% will just put solutes. And we're only going to look at the diffusion of water here. And so, therefore, to be an isotonic solution, this solution means that it's the, the solute concentration is the same to that inside the cell. So, therefore, inside the cell, we would also have 50% solutes and 50% water. And if that's the case, then if the co water concentration is the same outside and inside the cell, water is going to go in and out at equal rates. Water is going to go in and out at equal rates, and therefore the cell is not going to balloon up or shrivel up because it's not going to really gain or lose um, water because it's in a solution that's the same. So notice that if the solutes are the same, then inside and outside the same concentration of solutes, then the water concentration is going to be the same, and so there's going to be no net water movement. So then let's look at this. The solute concentration is greater than that inside the cell, and the cell loses water. So let's look at that. If you have, I'm going to make this bigger here. So this is your cell. That cell loses water. Water is going to go, the net water movement is going to leave the cell, right? So, where is your higher water concentration going to be, inside or outside the cell? It's going to be inside because water goes from high to low concentration. So, let's just pick a number. Say this is 90% water here. And so, then we can say then for the water to move out, it has to be anywhere less than 90%. So, it could be 70% water, anything less. So therefore, water will move out. So what percent solutes is inside the cell? 10%, right? I'll just put SOL for, and this is for um, solutes, and 30% solutes here. And so water, the net water movement is going to go out. We call this solution a hypertonic solution. Hypertonic solution, the solute concentration is greater than that inside the cell. So therefore, we can think of it as the solute concentration is greater, um, and so, or we can think of the water concentration as less. All right, either way, um, we're getting the same result. So water moving from high to low water concentration, or if we look at the solutes, it's going to move towards the higher solute concentration. So what we do is. Um, uh, uh, look at, so kind of work backwards that way. So what I'd like you to do in your notes here is to do this on your own with the next one. So here's your cell. The cell gains water. So what I'd like you to do is do what I did here. Put an arrow as far as, pause the video, put an arrow where water is going to move, and then give me sample percentages. So pause that and do that. Okay, so you should have the cell gains water, so you should have the water going into the cell. That means your higher water concentration is going to be outside the cell. So we could say 80% water here and 60% water here. You don't have to have 80 and 60 to, to have done it right. Your percentage of water on the outside of the cell should be higher than what's inside the cell. So then this, then this would mean it's 20% solutes and 40% solutes. And so it's going to move into the cell, and it's going to balloon up. And here it would have shriveled because the water is leaving. We call this a hypotonic solution. So we're talking about the solution on the outside. So let me write here. When um, you have over here a hypotonic, so this is a hypotonic solution. 
and um, out on the outside. So we're talking about this solution on the outside. But let me tell, talk about, let's go back up to this uh, example here and talk about the relationship between the words hyper and hypotonic. So in this case here, the solution was hypertonic, right? On the outside, it's a hypertonic solution. The solute concentration is greater than inside the cell. So let's say here the solution is hypertonic cell, or another way to think of this is that the cell is hypotonic to the solution, hypotonic. So when you have a hypertonic solution, if the outside is hypertonic, um, that means the inside, comparatively speaking, would be hypotonic. And so um, one has to have the greater water concentration, one has to have the lower water concentration, or um, vice versa with the solutes. And so here we would say the outside, the solution outside, is hypotonic to the solution inside the cell, or the inside the cell is hypertonic to the outside of the cell. And notice here that the water is always moving from hypo to hyper. Hypotonic is going to have this greater concentration of water to hypertonic. All right. And so when you have a solution that's one or the other, the other solution that you're comparing it to will be the opposite, and water flows from high to low or hypo to hyper. So animals without cells and other organisms without rigid cell walls have osmotic problems in either a hyper or hypotonic environment. So if this is the, so that's this case. If this was a unicellular organism in a lake, it's going to lose water and it's going to shrivel up, right? That's not a good thing. And if this is the lake water compared to the unicellular organism, it's going to take in a bunch of water. And without a rigid cell wall, what can happen is this thing can explode. It can blow up like a balloon and eventually pop. So to maintain their internal environment, such organisms must have adaptations for osmoregulation. That means regulating the diffusion of water the control of water balance. So uh, we've talked about this already. So the protus paramecium, which is hypertonic to its pond water environment, has a, remember this, a contractile vacuole that acts as a pump. So remember, if this little guy here, here's your paramecium, it's in a hypertonic environment, that means it has a, um, uh, sorry, hypotonic environment. It is hypertonic to its what? So it's hypertonic inside, which means that it's hypotonic outside, which has a greater water concentration, hypo, greater water concentration, which means water is going to go in. So remember, they have those little contractile vacuoles that the water goes in, and then they contract and squirt the water back out. So these guys will never blow up and explode. So that's a protection measurement. Plant cells don't need that. So cell walls help maintain water balance. So a plant cell in a hypotonic solution swells until the cell wall opposes uptake. The cell is now what we call turgid. It's very firm. So remember that you have this cell wall, all right, and you have the cell membrane under the cell wall. Actually, I should let's put that in a different color here. So this is your cell membrane. This is your cell wall. So if it's, if it's put in, let me get a different color here to do the water. So if it's put in a hyper, or hypo, sorry, tonic solution, that means it has the greater water concentration outside the cell. What happens is water is going to go into that cell, but in, as it fills up and fills up and fills up with water, it's going to start putting pressure on the cell membrane. And that cell membrane is going to squish up against the cell wall, putting pressure. But eventually, that cell wall won't let it expand anymore. So that cell wall is going to be 
um, uh, have a lot of pressure against it, but it won't let the pressure increase to a, to a point where it'll explode. So therefore, um, this is what we call this plant cell turgid. And plant cells like this state because this helps, uh, remember plant cells are, are plants, when we look at um, a stem, are many, many smaller you know, plant cells put together. And so therefore, when we, we want every single one of these plant cells to be filled to the max with water so that it's putting pressure against the cell walls and that makes them stand up straight. If you don't water your plants, the, the water is going to start being used up and then those cell walls, there's not enough pressure inside and they'll start to wilt and so on and um, uh, eventually could die. So plants like to be turgid there. So if a plant cell and its surroundings are isotonic, There's no net movement of water into the cell, and the cell becomes what is called flaccid or, or limp. That's when you're, all the plant cells would um, not have enough pressure, and that's when you get plants wilting. So when you don't water your plants, they, they wilt and bend. So that's not ideal um, for plants. They like to be filled with water to, for help with their structure. And then in a hypertonic solution, in a hypertonic environment, plant cells will lose water, and then eventually the membrane pulls away from the wall, and this is called plasmolysis. It's so a lethal, causes death, right? That's what lethal means. So let me draw that here. Um, so here's your plant cell, and here's that cell membrane. When it's filled with water, that cell membrane is right against, so it's filled with water right against the cell wall. When it's in a hypertonic solution, what happens is that cell membrane kind of looks like this, kind of comes away from the cell wall. That's because there's a lesser concentration of water because the water is moving out. And so you can think of this is like a little balloon inside the cell and the cell membrane continues to shrivel, shrivel, shrivel because there's nothing that's filling it. And so therefore the cytoplasm, which is made out of mostly water, is really getting lesser and lesser of a volume. And so that cell membrane kind of pulls away from the wall and that's called plasmolysis. And if this happens to all the cells of your plant, then the plant can die. And this is where I would like to stop for today.